So we're back at it. This is now round two. And we will also be concluding on some of the courses today. There will be a season finale coming out for pediatrics. So two videos again today. Get your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Exam Secrets. My name is Dr. Moses Kazebu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we'll look at exam questions in one clinical course. This is season three, episode six, Internal Medicine. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell those that are writing pediatrics that there will be a season finale coming out right after this video. So you already know the gist of these videos. You may actually pause the video to scream your answers at your screen as well as to write them down. And let's go with our question one. Daniel comes to the admission ward with complaints of weakness, nausea, fatigue, and poor appetite. He is a known HIV positive patient on heart, AZT, 3TC, and noverapine for over two years. His last CD4 count was 200 cells per mil. At baseline was 55 cells per mil. He was recently diagnosed to have sputum positive PTB at the local clinic and started on antitubiculous treatment. List two problems Daniel has and justify your answers. List and justify investigations you would order. Outline your management plan. So you may pause the video right now and here comes the answer. So this is a person that's on HIV treatment and they have been on treatment for two years, especially the AZT, 3TC and the Verpine, which is what we previously used to put our patients on. They have been on this treatment for two years and their CD4 count is 200 cells per mil. Their baseline was 55, so already we can see that there isn't much of an increase from 55 to 200 because this person has been treatment for two years. Moreover, they've come in, they are coming with an opportunistic infection. That's your pulmonary TB. So this obviously is um, one problem is that they could be treatment failure. <coughs> Excuse me. This is because despite Daniel actually being on treatment for two years, he has clinical symptoms that are showing that he's deteriorating. <clears throat> so he's going to be having things like a poor rise in the CD4 count, given the presence of opportunistic infections. Then, of course, the other thing that may be the problem is poor compliance and ad adherence to treatment. Of course, this can also be justified by the poor rise in the CD4 count over the past two years, because you assume if someone is really taking their drugs over two years, it means that it's either the drugs are not working or they're not taking them right. So it could also be attributed to the emergence of the pulmonary tuberculosis. And of course, we can also think that the AZT can also cause bone marrow suppression that can also lead to a decrease in the white blood cell count that may predispose him to the PTB. So it could be also a complication of the drug, but probably unlikely. List and justify the investigations you would order. So this is in the next slide. Same thing with the management is in the subsequent slide. So this is the investigations I would order. So my liver enzymes, and take note that I've said liver enzymes. There's a huge difference between liver function tests and liver enzymes. I shall mention that along the same episode. So your liver enzymes, your AST and ALT because the tuberculous drugs are hepatotoxic. Your urea, electrolytes, and creatinine because you want to assess the, the functioning of the uh, kidneys before you actually change the antiretroviral therapy because remember that there is a preparation of tenofovir that we do not use 
patients that have renal failure. Moreover, we do not use one combination of tenofovir in patients that have a concurrent ATT. So you want to calculate your creatinine clearance. And of course, you're also going to be looking at your full blood count to assess the WBC for infections. Look out for any pancytopenias that may indicate the dovidine induced bone marrow suppression. And of course, your viral load may assess the level of the viremia and the effectiveness of your treatment. Uh, get a chest x-ray for the pulmonary involvement to also rule out other pathologies and also compare with the previous radiographs that the patient may have taken as well as uh, for future purposes to gauge the effectiveness of the treatment or whether this person is improving. And of course, repeat the sputum microscopy culture sensitivity to assess the effectiveness of the treatment uh, and a lumbar puncture for CNS analysis, biochemistry as well as a CT scan of the head if possible to rule out any CNS opportunistic infections. Of course, you would want to do the CT scan first to rule out any space occupying lesions to prevent complications of coning. Our uh, treatment is going to be admitting the patient, so we're going to continue them on the ATT, that's the full fixed dose combination drugs. Remember that the intensive phase is two months and the continuation phase is four months. That's a six months in total for uncomplicated pulmonary TB. So we're going to start off with your rifampicin, isoniazid, prisinamide, and ethambutol in the intensive phase. Then in the continuation phase, you drop off prisinamide and ethambutol and just continue with rifampicin and isoniazid. We repeat our sputum and chest x-ray after 14 days of treatment. Then after the patient stabilizes, we should change the antiretroviral drugs to a, a newer regimen. So that's an abacava based regimen because we want to avoid the tenofovir TDF preparation in patients that are on rifampicin. And we also want to increase the delta gravia to 50 milligrams twice a day. Then, so we're going to be giving uh, abacava, lamuvudine, um, and delta gravia. And of course, we keep the patient hydrated. We monitor the urine output every day, monitor the creatinine and lymph function tests weekly, then counsel the patient on adherence, compliancy, and side effects of the drugs. And we discharge them via psychosocial counseling when they improve and review them in clinic after two weeks. So the, the goal thing, the key thing here is to patient education on compliancy is very, very important in this case. Question two. A 27-year-old nurse from Kawe General Hospital presents to the emergency room. She had complained of a headache the previous night associated with fever around midnight. She developed vomiting and started feeling cold. Physical examination revealed altered mental status with Glasgow coma scale of 8 out of 15. A, a still... A stiff, the supposed to be stiff neck, and a rash on her legs and abdomen. Her blood pressure was 85 over 45. Pulse was weak, about 115 beats per minute. A lumbar puncture was done in high pressure, and gram stain showed a gram negative intracellular diplococcus. What is the diagnosis? Right and full. What is the causative organism? List the most severe complication of this infection. What is your management plan for the contacts of to this patient? What is the management plan for the members of the community where she resides? What is the treatment of choice for this patient? So you may pause the video right now. And here comes the answer. So this woman here has a disseminated meningococcal infection. Why do I say so? She has a meningitis, which is obviously due to the Neisseria meningitidis. And how do I know that it's Neisseria meningitidis? She has this gram-negative tracellar diplococci that's, of course, isolated from her cerebrospinal fluid. She's also in shock. So actually, if I was to be exact, she is in what is referred to as a fulminant meningococcal sepsis, which is the complication. But then I was looking at option A and option C, you would be put in the same answer twice. Then of course, um, the petechiae is usually a feature, especially very common in gram-negative organisms where they injure the endothelium. So you get to see this petechiae on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. You also get to see them over the abdomen. So this is going to be caused, obviously, by your Neisseria meningitidis. The most severe complication is your fulminant meningococcal sepsis, where you have vascular collapse. It is also referred to as a waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. Now, for the contacts to this patient, you want to offer them prophylaxis. So you want to pretty much give them rifampicin, 600 milligrams, twice a day, uh, for two days in adults. And for children, 10 milligrams per kg. Uh, twice a day um, for those that are greater than a year old. Then alternative to rifampicin in adults, you can give ciprofloxacillin 750 milligrams as a stat dose. You should avoid this in children. 
Then for the community, we pretty much want to vaccinate them. So with the ACWY type of vaccine or the meningococcus C vaccine, we want to screen and treat any positive cases. The treatment of choice is, of course, your penicillin G, your crystalline penicillin, 3 to 4 million international units every 4 hours for 7 to 10 days. Of course, alternatively, ceftriaxone can actually work. Your 2 gram uh, BD can actually work in treating this, but your treatment of choice is usually the penicillins. Namakau, a 25-year-old lady, comes in with symmetrical joint pains, which are poor C articular. She has been having them for seven weeks. She also has fatigue, dry eyes, and dry mouth. She admits to joint swelling. She is not aware of any known family history of arthritis. The screening examination reveals joint tenderness in her metacarpal phalanges and metatarsal um, phalangeal joints. Then the screening examination for musculoskeletal disease is known by the acronym GALES. What does GALES stand for? Define POSI articular, list six important serological investigations you would do in this patient. What radiological tests would you do? List four examples of diffuse connective tissue. List four criterion categories used in the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Give three causes of monoarthritis. So you may actually pause the video. This is actually a very important thing because I'm going to introduce new concepts here, especially on the criteria that I want you to pay very, very close attention to because they actually may show up on your exam. So here comes the answer. So GALES just simply stands for gait, arms, legs, and the spine. And POSI articular just means involvement of four or fewer joints. So, so four or less. Then the six important serological investigations that we would want to do is anticyclic, anticyclinate, anticyclic citrullinated peptide, which is usually more specific to rheumatoid arthritis. We also want to do rheumatoid factor. We want to look at anti-Smith, ANA, uh, anti-double-stranded DNA, and anti-Rho antibodies. And then our radiological test, we may do an ultrasound, um, an X-ray, not an ultrasound. And of course, we may do some bone scans. Um, we may actually order for an MRI as well. Then four examples of diffuse connective tissue diseases. You have SLE. This is, this is supposed to be SLE, not SE. SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, scleroderma, polymyositis or dermatomyositis, Marfan um, syndrome, Sjogren syndrome. And of course, four criterion that are used in the diagnosis. So this is known as the Euler ACR uh, diagnostic criteria. They may actually ask you this. There's one diagnostic criteria that's used for rheumatoid arthritis. There's one that's going to be used for SLE. So one is going to be joint involvement. The second one is going to be serology. The third one is going to be symptom duration. The fourth one is going to be your acute phase reactants. I'll show you a detailed picture in the next slide. And of course, the causes of monoarthritis include trauma, septic, septic arthritis, or crystals depositing in joints. It could be your gout or your pseudogout. Now, here is the Euler ACR classification. So I'll start with the easiest thing, which is the duration. So if anyone who has less than six weeks duration, you give them a score of zero. Anyone greater than six weeks, six weeks or more, you give them a score of one. Then let's come to the acute phase reactants. If they have normal CRP and normal ESR, you give them a score of zero. If they have abnormal CRP or abnormal ESR, you give them a score of one. Then we come to the serology. So here, if they do not have rheumatoid factor, and if you have negative anti-citrullinated uh, polypeptide antibodies, you give them zero. If they have low positive rheumatoid factor or low positive anti-citrullinated anti uh, polypeptides or citrullinated protein antibodies, we give them a score of two. There's no one here. Then, of course, if they have high of, of either, you give them a score of three. Then with the joint distribution, if it's a large joint, one large joint, it's a score of zero. If it's 2 to 10 large joints, we give them a score of 1. If it's 1 to 3 small joints and the large joints not counted, we give them a score of 2. If it's 4 to 10 small joints with the large joints not counted, we give them a score of 3. And of course, if it's more than 10 joints with at least one small joint, we give them a score of 5. Take note that there is no 4 here. And of course, you add them and you get a total score. So a score that's 6 or more is definitive for rheumatoid arthritis. I hope that makes some sense. Moving on to question four. A 35-year-old alcoholic was found lying in the gutter unconscious. I think I covered this question if I did and it's a repetition. Well, good, good luck for you. 
you may get everything correct. He looked malnourished with nicotine-stained fingers, du bilateral dupe trains contractures, and spider nevi. His temperature was 35.8 degrees Celsius, respiratory rate 24 uh, beats per minute, breaths per minute, uh, blood pressure was 100 over 60, and his pulse was 60 breaths per minute. Heart sounds were normal, as were chest and abdominal examinations. There was no facial or skull bruising and no neck stiffness. His GCS was 5. He extended his limbs to pain. Pupils were equal at 4 millimeters. Pupillary and corneal reflexes were normal. His eyes were disconjugate, but ocalocephalic reflexes were intact. Limb tone was increased with brisk reflexes and bilateral upgoing planters. List any six possible causes of this clinical presentation. Mention any six diagnostic investigations you would do. How would you manage this patient? So take your time to actually think through this video. Or the question rather. So here comes the answer. So this is a person that's an alcoholic. So they're a known alcoholic. So we can't rule out that this person had acute alcoholic intoxication. It could be the reason. It could be the reason why they have acute alcoholic intoxication. In addition to this, this uh, patient here has these features of chronic uh, liver disease. So they have uh, bilateral duplicates contractures. They have spider nevi, and of course, this could be. The reason why you're having these uh, hepatic encephalopathy, they may have a chronic liver disease. That's the second thing that could be causing this. And of course, this, found this, this person is found lying in a gutter. They could have been attacked. And the fact that they have some bruising over the skull, uh, actually, there was no facial or skull bruising. Sorry, there was no facial or skull bruising, but it could be due to trauma. They could have been attacked. Okay, so we do not want to rule out any trauma. Even when they fell in the gutter, they could have injured themselves. We do not want to rule that out. Then, of course, it's cold, so it could be due to hypothermia, and this person hasn't eaten, and they're unconscious. They could have hypoglycemia. In some cases, they may, this may even be due to malnutrition. You may also consider other things like sepsis to have caused this, but of course, um, with the sepsis, we would have some derangements in the different vitals. So what are the six diagnostic investigations that are going to be done? Our random blood sugar. We're also going to be doing our full blood count with the differential blood couches, liver function tests, as well as liver enzymes. Notice how I'm mentioning liver function tests and liver enzymes on the same thing. So liver function tests, you're pretty much going to be looking at your serum bilirubin. You're going to be looking at your serum albumin. You're going to be looking at your prothrombin time and your international normalization ratio. We also do a CT scan of the head. We also look at the serum urea, electrolytes, and creatinine. Now, how would you manage this patient? So we want to pretty much admit this patient to ICU because they're unconscious. We nurse them while they're propped up. We push in an AG tube. We catheterize them and monitor the urine and put an output charts. We gain venous access. So pretty much doing your ABCs. Check that the airway is patent. The patient is breathing. The gaining uh, circulation. And of course, plus or minus of blood transfusion, depending on whatever you find from the full count or the levels of their blood cells. Then, of course... And because this person is a chronic liver disease patient, we also want to give them vitamin K, which is not shown here because they have the risk of bleeding. And they may also need platelet transfusion or your cryoprecipitate or FFP. Of course, if they're hypoglycemic, treat them with dextrose, give them thiamine, give them B6 and B12 as well as folic acid. Open a GCS chart, monitor their vitals, cover them with antibiotics. Of course, those that are that are not hepatotoxic, then of course the definitive management is largely going to depend on the underlying cause. Coming to our last and indeed final question, a 44-year-old coal miner presented with a three-month history of polyuria, dyspnea on exertion. He had developed a frontal headache the past six weeks and was sweating profusely. He had recently noticed tingling in his hands, which was worse at, on, at night. On systemic inquiry, he admitted to loss of libido and impotence for six years. On examination, he has coarse face, macrognathia, spayed hand, and feet with thick skin. Heart rate is 100 beats per minute, regular with a BP of 200 over 100. Neurological examination was grossly normal except for the bitemporal hemianopsia. And of course, a reduced sensation to pinprick over the thumb, 
index and ring fingers. What is the diagnosis? Give two possible causes of polyuria. What is uh, the cause of the bitemporal hemianopsia? What is the cause of reduced sensation over to pinprick over the thumb, index, and the ring finger? Then, of course, what single test would you use to confirm diagnosis? Give another test that will help you in locating the cause of the bilateral hemianopsia. So I'll give you five seconds to pause the video. And here comes the answer. So this person has hypertension and most likely what can explain all these symptoms is of course a condition that's known as acromegaly or gigantism where they have a pituitary adenoma in most of the cases that is producing a lot of growth hormone causing these features to be seen. So the reason why this person may have polyuria is because uh, often patients that have this acromegaly have impaired glucose metabolism so they could have associated diabetes mellitus. They could also have problems with ADA secretion where they... Um, Actually, where they have these problems and they are secreting, um, what do you call this, ADH. So I don't want to really call this as diabetes insipidus. So I actually want to change this answer here midway. I know this here, instead of uh, diabetes insipidus, I was supposed to actually... Actually, no, diabetes insipidus. I don't know why I'm second-guessing myself. I was uh, really thinking about... Uh, this condition syndrome of inappropriate ADA secretion but then I realized that the syndrome of inappropriate ADA secretion you're pretty much going to be reabsorbing the the um, what do you call this reabsorbing the water because you are releasing a lot of ADH but in diabetes insipidus you are either not producing enough ADH or the kidneys are not responding to the ADH so you're losing this water through polyuria so obviously it should be diabetes insipidus Forget about that little stint that we just had. So what is the cause of bitemporal hemianopsia? So most likely it's a pituitary adenoma that's going to be compressing on the optic chiasma. And the reason why we're having the reduced sensation over the, the thumb, the index finger and the ring finger, is because of carpal tunnel syndrome. Most likely the entrapment of the median nerve. Because remember the median nerve is the one that's going to be supplying these parts. Then of course the single test that would do either growth hormone or insulin growth like factor one assays and we can actually make a diagnosis of this and we'll be able to see the pituitary adenoma when you do an MRI of the head but as well as some skull x-rays may also be important but it's much more easier to see on the MRI of the head. I really hope you enjoyed that and by I'm sure by next week we would have concluded and had the season finales for those that are actually participating in exams we're going to be putting out season finales the subsequent week or rather in the coming two weeks because individuals will be going for their final exams very soon so please tell a friend to tell a friend that exam week still continues on the channel i've missed everything that's going on and in between we shall also be posting some videos on oski stations i know i did a lot of extensive oski stations that's why i had a step back a bit on the oski stations but we will resume them if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.